True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. You know, there's no one more innocent than a 14-month-old child, the age Jaden Lesky was when he disappeared. Jaden was born in and lived his life in poverty and surrounded by ignorance. Some would say that his mother loved him and she tried her best. Others would say she was a careless and neglectful drunk. Either way, the outcome is the same. Most of us love our kids. We do our best to keep them well cared for and safe, regardless of our socioeconomic status or the stress that life may send our way. Maybe this is why we feel justified in judging parents like Jaden's mother, Belinda. Not because she was young, unmarried, poor, or a heavy drinker even, but because she failed to keep Jaden safe. Join us at the quiet end today for Broken Boy, the Jaden Lesky story. It is a hard story to tell and a hard one to hear, but we're coming to this story with empathy and we're making an effort to understand a really dark side of our human condition. And fortunately, we have a beer to drink while we delve into this. Yeah, too bad it's not a higher alcohol by volume because I could use something like that. Well, you know, there's really no reason why we couldn't do shots with our beer, so think about that. I might, because this, like you said, this is a tough story, a tough one to tell, a tough one to hear about. Absolutely. So I chose a beer from Cooper's Brewery called Original Pale Ale. This is an English pale ale with an ABV of 4.5%. Not a bad beer. It's hazy gold, got a one-inch white head, a little bit of lacing, nice aroma, kind of some sweet malt, grassy hops. Has a bready taste with a little bit of hops late. So a light-bodied, easy-drinking beer. One that we call a lawnmower beer. Absolutely. Sounds okay, though. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's innocuous enough. Yeah. Well, let's open it up. Okay. All right. Let's take it down to the quiet end. Oh, it's looking festive down there today. Well, it's holiday season. We've got some nice lights, some other things. Yeah. So, absolutely. And our friend uh, Billy Bob Santa <laughs> is still here. Yeah, and his groupies. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. What is it you women have about Santa Claus? Well, it's a deep-seated childhood thing, obviously. <laughs> Daddy issues. I'm not going into that then. Never yeah, mind. Let's not address it today. Okay. We'll just relax down here. we got plenty of beer for our bar buddies, so let's have a good time with the beer. Sure. So why don't you start this horrible story? Okay. Jaden Lesky was born into poverty as the son of a young single mother in 1996. His mother, her name is Belinda, had a difficult childhood in a family that had its own share of dysfunction. So Belinda was born in 1975, which means she was 21 years old when she gave birth to Jaden. Belinda was the second child to her teenage mother and her father. Dad worked in a timber mill. Belinda's sister Katie was three years older. Katie and Belinda's childhoods were marked by alcoholism and violence. Their mother and father fought, and there many times he got thrown out of the house. And she had a little brother named Glenn. He was born just before their father moved out for good. Now, after he moved out, it was mom, the two girls, and the little boy. And the family moved frequently throughout central and eastern Victoria, barely scraping by financially. Yes, yeah, so Katie ran away when she was just 14 years old. And the story goes that she only returned home so that her mother would buy her some cigarettes. But then again, at age 16, Katie ran away again, and this time she moved to a town called Mo, Moe's Industrial. It had prospered when the coal mines and electrical power stations were state-owned, but then after privatization, unemployment soared, and a recession hit the area. 
A lot of workers moved away to find good jobs, and housing prices really plummeted. There were still some nicer areas of Mo, but the part of town where Katie fled to was quite poor. Homes there could sell for as little as $15,000. But because it was cheap to live there, the government decided to relocate single mothers to Mo. This way, their welfare payments would go further. But the consequence, which they didn't really think about, I guess, was that a population of dislocated and unemployed people grew in Mo. It became common for people to live there without steady jobs, drug use became endemic, and there was a real lack of hope for the future of these families. And it was in Mo that Katie met Brett Lesky. She was at a party where she got pretty drunk, which was kind of normal for her, and Brett chatted her up. They ended up having sex that same night. Katie brought Brett back to her mother's place the next day, proudly showing off her cute new boyfriend. At this time, Belinda was a young teen, and Katie introduced her to Brett. Belinda was jealous of Katie's independence and freedom. While Katie would be out partying and picking up guys, Belinda felt like she was stuck at home. But Katie was jealous of Belinda also, who everyone said was the pretty one. Belinda was pretty, but she had a tall and rugged build. Her hair was bleached blonde with dark roots, and she dressed in clothes that were very tight. But in contrast to this, her childlike face gave her a real look of purity and innocence. So she attracted a fair amount of young men and boys. Well, and like you said, she's just barely in her teens. Yeah, but in this region, in this family, yeah. people started young. They did, so she was a catch. Now, Katie, her sister, and Brett did not have a very ideal relationship. They did, however, stay together for several months. Eventually, Brett and Katie moved in with his parents. That's Ray and Elizabeth Lesky. They were dairy farmers. They were also devout Baptists. So they allowed Katie to stay with them and help with milking the cows. But that arrangement lasted less than six months. Well, yeah, Brett's parents were very helpful and wanted to help out, but they weren't going to put up with drinking and partying or drugs, any of that. So it really couldn't last long because Katie was really into that stuff. Right, and they weren't married. No, they weren't. But after that, Katie did return to live with her mother, Pam, and her sister, Belinda. Pam had a stroke, which left her left side completely paralyzed. When she returned home from the hospital, Belinda was just 16, but became her mother's primary caretaker. Katie was uncomfortable and not at all interested in helping out. And she got pregnant by another man, but she allowed Brett to think that this baby was his. So thinking he was doing the right thing and encouraged by his Baptist parents to do the right thing, Brett proposed to Katie, and she accepted. Now Belinda believed that Katie had tricked Brett into marrying her. She was pretty sure it wasn't Brett's baby that her sister was pregnant with. Yeah, but at the same time, she believed that Brett had proposed to Katie for the wrong reasons also, because Brett was in trouble. He was facing jail time. He had stolen some checks from his boss and forged them for cash. Now, by his thinking, if he's got a pregnant fiance, he could get lenient treatment because he had a young family to support. That's a pretty drastic step to take just to get less jail time. But I guess if you're young, you don't understand that you're changing your whole life forever. <laughs> no, we're looking at the short term, not the long picture. Sure. So Katie and Brett's wedding wasn't anything fancy. Baptist minister from his parents' church officiated the service, and this took place in the front yard of the Lesky's farmhouse. The rings had been purchased from a pawn shop. Katie wore a used gown. There was only a handful of family and friends in attendance. So when the wedding was first announced, Katie's entire family said they would not attend. They didn't agree with this marriage, since they felt it was based on a lie. Now, some family members gave in and did show up, but not Belinda. Well, Belinda claimed she wouldn't attend the wedding because she didn't want to wear a dress. Belinda did not like to wear dresses. She was a real tomboy. But Brett's mother, Elizabeth Lesky, really believed that Belinda wanted Brett for herself. She'd seen the way Katie and Belinda interacted, and she saw that Belinda was very jealous of her sister and her sister's relationship with Brett. Neither of Brett's parents were excited about this marriage, as you can imagine, but they tried to be supportive for Brett's sake. So the couple was allowed to move back in with the Leskies on their farm, but it only took a few weeks for them to be thrown out. 
After that, the couple moved in with Brett's sister, Louise, and eventually rented their own small house. Katie and Brett stayed together for less than a year after their wedding, but it was long enough for Katie to become pregnant again. No one was sure what the reason for this breakup was, but no one was really surprised either. No, I don't think they would be, given the history thus far. Absolutely. Now, Katie's second pregnancy, this time as Brett's child, was a girl. They would name her Shannon. During his pregnancy, Brett suffered from depression and anxiety. He would lie around the house all day, unable to work or help out at all with the housework. Then Belinda moved in with him, and things got even worse. Katie began to suspect that her husband was sleeping with her little sister. So Katie threw Brett and by Linda out of the house, and the two of them moved in with Brett's sister Louise afterwards. Now Belinda denied that she was involved with Brett beyond a friendship. Well, it sure sounds different for me, but Katie was convinced. So the relationship between the two sisters fell apart, and they didn't speak for a long time. Well, according to Belinda, her romance with Brett didn't begin until two months after Katie threw them out. But most people really don't believe that, because they didn't waste any time becoming pregnant, or they just didn't bother using any birth control. I'm not sure which one it was. But the couple had a daughter. They named her Brianna. And that name they'd gotten from a clerk at the local supermarket. They liked it. They spelled it differently. They were very into spelling names differently. Yeah, with Brianna, was like Brihana or something like that, like a hyphenated name almost. Yeah, and Belinda's B-I-L-Y-N-D-A. Yeah. So it's a family thing. But Brett was still married to Katie when he had a daughter with Belinda. So Brett had children with two sisters. So think about that. I mean, that makes him the father and the uncle to both sister's children. Yikes. Very confusing. But this couldn't have concerned him or Belinda too much because they soon had a son together also. And this was little Jaden Lesky. Jaden was born in April of 1996. Belinda picked his name from an attractive guest she had noticed on an episode of the Ricky Lake Show. Jaden was a chubby baby and very lovable. He loved his mom especially, and he cried when she left him. Belinda would describe him as a clingy baby who cried a lot, but Elizabeth Lesky believed that he was just a lonely baby who wasn't getting the attention that he needed and deserved from his mother. Now, Jaden lived with his big sister and parents before Belinda and Brett broke up, just before Jaden's first birthday. Belinda and Katie's strain with the relationship played a part in the breakup, because Belinda believed that Katie was still in love with Brett, and Belinda said that she wanted to marry Brett But then she became involved with another man, and she and Brett broke up. Brett had been working in a shed space shared with a man named Greg Domasowitz, if that's pronounced correctly. You did better than I would. During this time, Belinda and Greg became close. Now, Belinda liked Greg because he seemed interested in Jaden. He played with him a lot and spent time with him. Now, there are also many dynamics at work here. Remember this. Belinda had some bitterness towards Brett because she felt like he favored their daughter Brianna over Jaden. And she may have seen Greg as the preferred father figure for her son. She believed that Brett was always too busy to spend time with Jaden. Now, Greg seemed interested in Jaden, even took him off her hands from time to time, offering to babysit and teach him about cars. Well, yeah, isn't that what every infant needs to know? This is very twisted and difficult to understand. It was a strange dynamic which turned out to be very disturbing. Greg offered to watch Jaden quite a bit, but not his sister Brianna, and Belinda seemed to think this was a good thing. The only issue she initially mentioned to friends was that Greg didn't like to change Jaden's diaper. He would bring Jaden back to her for diaper changes, claiming that the smell was unbearable for him. But because Belinda saw her son as an incessant crier, she was happy to get a break when Greg babysat for him. For days after Jaden was returned from a visit with Greg, He wouldn't cry at all. So instead of seeing this as worrying, which I absolutely would, Belinda appreciated the quiet. After returning from Greg's house, Jaden would sometimes sleep for an entire day and entire night, and he didn't even seem hungry. So ominously, Belinda told one friend that she didn't know what Greg did to Jaden, but she didn't really want to know either. Yeah, well, he would come back and be quiet and sleep. That just makes my stomach hurt. How good is that, right? It's really alarming. 
So Belinda freely admitted that she was unable to handle Jaden's crying. She had taken him to the Mo Medical Center many times because of his incessant crying. Now on April 2, 1997, when Jaden was nearly a year old, he was examined by a physician who could find no reason for Jaden's crying. She wrote in her notes that Jaden was a happy, healthy baby boy. Yeah, but Belinda brought Jaden back on April 21st, and a different doctor saw him. This doctor took a urine sample to rule out a urinary tract infection, but couldn't find anything wrong with Jaden. Belinda wondered if she was suffering from postpartum depression, and that's why she was having so much trouble with this. And it's really unclear if anyone spoke to her about how to deal with a crying child or the big stresses of motherhood. I mean, she was a very young woman. That she was. And it doesn't sound like she had good pediatric care, or at least consistent pediatric care. I shouldn't say good or bad, but not consistent. Going to the ER for things like this instead of just seeing their family physician. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, and it, as you said, it's not clear if anyone talked to Belinda or Greg or Brett or anyone in this family how to deal with a crying child. No, and it's something that you teach new parents. It's part of the whole learning process. That's part of the deal. Yeah. We call it purple crying. Purple is an acronym for the crying period. So it's peak of crying. Crying peaks during the second month of life and then starts to decrease. Unexpected. Comes and goes for no apparent reason. It's resistant to soothing. The baby often looks like he's in pain. It can be long-lasting, 30, 40 minutes at a time. And it can happen in the evening. Purple. So the biggest thing to explain to parents is that it's a temporary thing. The baby's not in pain. You do what you can, and you try to make them realize that it's not anything they're doing, anything like that, to make the baby cry. Hopefully, you can keep people from hurting their kids for the crying. So what kind of ways do they learn to deal with it? I mean, what kind of practices can people do? I know one thing is you put the baby in a safe environment like the crib, and you just walk away for a while and give yourself a break. Well, that's the biggest thing. Yeah. Is to, because you're not going to get the baby probably to calm down on his or her own until they're ready to. So what you try to do is say it's, it's okay to put the infant down and walk away. Go read a book for a few minutes or do something. Just separate yourself from the situation. Right. But it can be pretty stressful. Oh, yeah. And, and if you're a relatively uneducated young person, it can be even worse. Right. You can really lose your temper, which it's hard to imagine, but it certainly can happen. Oh, yeah. And it was happening with Belinda, I feel quite certain. Yeah. There's, I don't think there's much question. And if anyone was less able to deal with the crying than Belinda, it would have been this Greg guy. Well, we're going to find out more information about him. Absolutely. But yeah, he would be even less likely to respond favorably to the crying. Yes. Than his girlfriend, whatever she was. Yeah, so Brett's mother, Jaden's grandma, Elizabeth Lesky, wasn't comfortable at all when she learned about Greg babysitting Jaden. She really thought it was odd for a single man to want to spend time with a baby alone, and I totally agree with her. But there were so many things that Elizabeth didn't approve of in her son's life and in the way that her grandchildren were being raised. This was just one of the things. And she said she didn't feel like there was anything she could do about it. I mean, she had told Belinda how she felt about it, and Belinda would just kind of say, yeah, sure, sure. But Belinda was going to do what she wanted to do. And for Belinda, this was almost too good to be true, right? She's stressed out with this crying child, and she wants to be out having fun. And then Greg says, hey, I'll take Jaden for the day. And it's something she just didn't turn down. And I don't know. I just can't forgive her for that. I think there's a lot I can forgive, a lot I can understand. But I'm not on board with that from anyone. Well, you're probably more charitable than me. Yeah. She was at least as culpable in this whole situation as Greg. All right. Well, explain a little bit more why you're saying that. Well, just the statement that I don't know what he does with him, and I, uh, don't, and I don't want to know. I know, right? I mean, that whole thing. You're telling me she didn't think anything was wrong when this poor kid would come back from being with Greg, that he wouldn't eat, he slept? I mean, please. Yeah, I really believe that he was drugging the child, if not worse. I mean, it's just really so irresponsible. 
and this is the type of thing I find incredibly frustrating. After something tragic happens to a child, everyone has an opinion and something to say about what was going on. But what did anyone here do to really protect Jaden? The grandmother, Elizabeth, never really offered to take care of her grandson instead of Greg, not that I know of, and did she talk to Belinda or Brett about this situation in detail? If you have concerns, you really need to tell someone. And if they don't do something, you do something. I mean, this is a 14-month-old. This child is completely helpless and dependent on the adults in his life for love and for protection. And he was completely neglected and failed. He certainly was. And it's easy to say after the fact, oh, I knew something was wrong or... Sure. You know, damn it, do something when it's going on. Yeah, I've got no patience for that bullshit. Nope. So let's add to the fact of this horrible story that Greg was a really strange and disturbed individual. He lived alone in a broken down house with a shed where he intermittently did some work on cars. At the back of his house, the ground was just littered with rusty car parts and overgrown weeds. And among this mess, he kept a large white plastic bucket filled with fish guts and fish heads. And he said that he was keeping this for his enemies. So when Greg felt slighted or mistreated by someone, he liked to take a big syringe full of the fish liquid from the bucket and inject it into that person's air conditioning unit in their car or their house. And of course, the smell would be awful and almost impossible to get rid of. And this was just one of the sick pranks that Greg liked to do. This is probably one of the more mild ones. <laughs> okay. Now, he was also known to be pretty weird and often out of control. So it it's just wasn't a person you would trust to take care of a young kid. No, you wouldn't. But Belinda did. Or maybe she didn't really trust him, but she didn't care enough to stop it, right? I'd go with that. Yeah. I, I, again, I, I think she knew what was going on, but it was just so nice to have someone taking care of this kid who cried all the time, and she didn't really care what was going on. Yeah, it just seems like she made a conscious decision to overlook all of the red flags because it was just more convenient for her. I mean, I hate to say it, but how else can you see it? No, that's exactly it. Greg didn't grow up to be this way without having gone through some trauma when he was a kid. When he was 14 years old, a neighbor called to tell him that his father had just died of a heart attack. And the neighbor said, you got to go tell your mom. That's great. People, man. So within the next year, Greg had left school and started using drugs. He liked to work on cars, but he never completed any training. He got a grant and opened a repair shop in a shed, but he never took his work seriously, and he didn't have work on a steady basis. Yeah, and those who got to know Greg would describe him as a manipulator. Most of his pranks were ultimately harmless, but seldom were they really funny. One thing he liked to do was to borrow a friend's car, then call the friend and say that he had crashed it. Then he would return the car undamaged and laugh as the friend was relieved. So that one wasn't too bad, not very funny, but I guess harmless. But a lot of his pranks were not so benign. Yeah, one night someone broke into Belinda's house and swapped her kids into each other's beds. <laughs> Imagine that, going to check on Brianna, and there's poor old Jaden, and vice versa. That would be disconcerting. So many people knew Greg was responsible for this little prank, but Greg blamed his ex-girlfriend, Yvonne Penfold. Well, sure, you can call it a little prank, but it, someone did get into her house. You know, someone broke into her house. However they got in, that's not okay. Yep, it's not. No. But that wasn't the only time when Belinda's children were the targets of disturbing pranks and outright abuse. One night, Greg broke into the house and he force-fed peanut butter sandwiches to Jaden until he was vomiting. Belinda thought Greg was weird, but she didn't protect her children from these so-called pranks. Now that's abuse. Unquestionably, that's abuse. Isn't that awful? I mean, that shows a really sick person. Uh, yes, it does. And, once and, he and did, she didn't do anything. No, once he did that, you think she would have said, oh, no, you're not going to take care of my son. But she didn't. She would let him go with Greg. And Greg was also weird because he was obsessed with space aliens. And he told people he had once met these little green aliens. He had posters of them tacked on his walls. 
and he would leave a carton of milk on the roof of his house, saying that that way the aliens would drink the milk and they wouldn't take him up on their spaceship. He didn't like going on the spaceship. Well, they'd do experiments on him. Exactly. Now, he did seem to have a soft side for animals and children, which would impress women who met him, because he seemed to be so gentle and caring. But the other side of Greg, he was also known to have killed feral cats by putting them in a sack and lighting it on fire. Oh, fuck. And he was not kind to children when he was put in charge of them. Or their not care. at all, no. So Belinda started having sex with Greg, and then he began to see himself as kind of a father figure to Jaden. But it was only Jaden he was interested in, not Belinda's daughter, Brianna. He even told Belinda that she should give custody of her daughter to Brett and just keep Jaden. There's another big red flag she ignored. Yep. Greg said he wanted to raise Jaden and teach him about cars and guns. I mean, what could be more important than those two things? Greg really loved guns, and he kept a hole beneath his back steps of his house where he stored guns, many of them illegal. Belinda knew that Greg was into guns and that he smoked a lot of marijuana. Others would say that Greg was even into harder drugs and that he even sold drugs at times. But Belinda said she had only ever seen him smoke pot and drink some alcohol. And Belinda was a heavy drinker and pot smoker too, so she had no issue with this. It was okay to do that around her children. So Greg first babysat for Jaden in April of 1997. As Belinda became more comfortable leaving Jaden in Greg's care, she began leaving him for longer and longer periods of time with Greg. Sometimes even she'd come back to pick up Jaden, and Greg would tell her to come back later because he wanted to spend more time with Jaden. And of course, Belinda was glad to do that because she really liked the breaks it would give her. Yeah, and that makes me just kind of hate her, I have to say. I mean, the situation was clearly dangerous. Greg would not properly care for this child, and he couldn't stand it when Jaden cried. Greg saw Jaden as kind of a playmate, and even used him as a form of entertainment, controlling him, teasing him, and abusing him. Greg had a short temper and was quite cruel to Jaden. And another disturbing thing is that many friends saw him being cruel to Jaden. They saw him push Jaden onto his back, even bumping his head. Jaden would cry and Greg would just walk away. Sometimes he'd turn off the lights and leave Jaden crying in the dark. One friend of Greg would remember how Greg once turned the stereo on full blast with Jaden right in front of the speaker to drown out Jaden's scream. So who are these friends that let this happen and didn't say anything? And I wonder, did any of them go to Belinda and she just disregarded it? Because that wouldn't surprise me either. I mean, what do you think? Well, they're just as bad as the rest of the crew, you know, so they're not going to say anything. Well, I mean, okay. Are you, you waiting for them to say, oh, hey, man, you shouldn't be doing that to the little bugger? Sure, or at least go to the mother. Yeah, right. I mean, if it were me, I'd grab the child and leave and call the police. Well... Anybody with an ounce of compassion would do that, but these are all no good drug-using drunks. But, you know, do you ever try and think what's going on in the mind of such a young child when someone that is supposed to be taking care of them? I mean, this is going to make me cry because he's thinking these people are supposed to be taking care of him. He's so vulnerable. And then to be treated like that, I can't even imagine. Well, that's what's the toughest part of doing this episode. It's heartbreaking. It really is. Jaden was also put outside with Greg's large dogs, and Greg tried to get the dogs all riled up and purposely frighten Jaden with the dogs. Jaden was put in dangerous situations with the dogs in his muddy, cluttered yard, and he was returned to Belinda with scratches, a bloody lip, even bumps on his head. Also, Belinda overheard many times Greg calling Jaden awful names. I mean, awful names. I'm not even going to repeat them. And... She actually laughed sometimes when he did this, as did other people. Well, and she'd call him the same names. Yeah, she would. These fucking people. Yeah. Yeah. Like you said, none of Greg's friends ever went to Belinda with concerns over the abuse. Not that we know of. But the signs were pretty hard to miss, and the babysitting sessions continued and became longer. In May of 1997, Greg was allowed to take Jaden for an overnight. But he ended up returning him early to Belinda. Greg said he had lost it with Jaden. 
She didn't ask what had happened, but he had a big bruise on his face. Well, that just kind of sums her up, doesn't it? That she didn't even ask what happened. Nope. And that she will send her son back with this man again. She does. I now. guess Greg's explanation was that he had put Jaden into the car and bumped his head on the door. Then Jaden was crying and he couldn't remember what had happened after that because, as he said, he had lost it, which is just an ominous thing. That's nothing good. That should be your sign right there that he abused your child. I mean, whatever you want to say about it, Greg had physically abused this one-year-old. He certainly had. He and had a kid had a black eye, he was cut under his chin, and he had more bruising on the inside of his leg, his left leg. Belinda said, oh, I, I just felt sick when I saw those injuries. <sighs> Greg offered to tell the authorities that he is responsible for the injuries, but then he warned Belinda that if he did that, she might lose custody of her son. Well, there's the manipulator right there. You got it. So what's Belinda do? She says nothing and kept Jaden at home in hiding until his injuries healed. Well, and what blows me away, she didn't stop leaving Jaden with his abuser. And I think that's the worst thing she did. Well, at least that we know of for sure. I wouldn't be surprised if she did do worse things. Right. Because Greg really probably wasn't the only caretaker who had abused little Jaden. Belinda admitted that one night when Jaden wouldn't stop crying, she kicked him. She said she immediately felt bad and she took him to the doctor. But she hadn't admitted what she had done and apparently the doctor didn't report it. Yeah, so how do you not report that? I mean, what's the story? She said that he fell and he's got a bruise. I mean, one of the things you look for are bruises in funny places that shouldn't be there. Right, yeah. So... I don't know. I would assume in Australia they're mandatory reporters as well as the U.S. I didn't look into that, but I did assume that. I would. Yeah. But anyway, that happened and nothing changed. Just three weeks after the incident with Greg, Belinda allowed him to take Jaden for the day while she went out shopping with her sister. When she returned to pick him up, Greg had given him a weird haircut. Well, and that's putting it mildly because this was a very disturbing thing he did to the child. He had shaved Jaden's head to make it look like Greg's balding head, like shaved the bald spots, leaving some hair on the sides and stubble in the front. So that's disturbing, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Still, Belinda would leave Jaden with Greg one more time, and that would be the night when Jaden went missing. That was one more time too many, wasn't it? Yeah, right. All right, I got to go take a bath. Let's take a <laughs> short break here for our sponsors. Okay. What are you giving yourself as a gift this holiday season? How about the confidence that comes with an updated hair color? Whether you're just covering some gray or making a complete change in color, you can take coloring your hair at home to the next level with Madison Reed. Madison Reed gives you gorgeous professional hair color delivered to your door for less than $25. Madison Reed hair color is one of a kind because it's multidimensional and gives you your choice of over 45 multi-tonal shades that have been developed by master colorists who really know how to blend the nuances of cool, warm, light, and dark. Many of our listeners have written and told me how Madison Reed hair color has improved their lives, and I totally get it. Madison Reed delivers gray-covering, natural-looking hair color to my door when I want it. Now I'm saving money while my hair looks and feels better than ever. It's soft, strong, very natural looking, and I have one less thing to worry about. So I'm always happy to recommend Madison Reed to our listeners. It's affordable, convenient, and super high quality. We're busy women, especially this time of year. So don't we deserve gorgeous professional hair color delivered to our doors on our schedule for less than $25? Of course we do. You can find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com. True Crime Brewery listeners get 10% off plus free shipping on their first color kit by using our code BREWERY. That's code BREWERY at madison-reed.com. So Saturday, June 14th, 1997, Greg woke up at 11 in the morning, began to work on a car. 
Belinda and Katie had made up, and they had plans for a girls' night out. They were invited to a birthday party for a friend of Katie's boyfriend. So the sisters arranged for a babysitter. Julie, a local girl who knew their children, would care for Jaden and Brianna, along with Katie's two kids. Now Greg had plans too, so after he played Nintendo with some friends, he drove over to Belinda's house and surprised her. He said he wanted to babysit Jaden for the afternoon. He was working on a car, and he wanted Jaden with him to keep him company. Well, right there, I'd say fuck no. Why do you want a one-year-old to keep you company when you're working on a car? I mean, that just sounds dangerous. Doesn't it? It doesn't sound beneficial to the child in any way. Doesn't sound like it's anything that you need to have a one-year-old around for. Absolutely not. But of course, Belinda was okay with this idea. She told Greg about the party she was invited to and that she would be out all afternoon until late in the night. Greg said he would come back for Jaden in a couple of hours. So Belinda bathed Jaden and packed a bag for him, including some warm outfits, diapers, and snacks. She dressed him in tracksuit pants that had baby games written on them, a green shirt, a blue-green windbreaker jacket with a hood, and a red jacket over that. So when Greg returned, Jaden was ready to go. Belinda didn't have a car, so she asked Greg to drive her and Brianna to her sister Katie's house where the babysitter would be, and the sisters would leave for the party together from there. So when they get to Katie's house, Belinda asked Greg for $50. He gave her 70 so she could have an extra special night at the party. Now, they hadn't agreed on how long Jaden would stay with Greg, but there was an understanding that Greg would drop off Jaden back at Katie's later to be with the babysitter and the other children. So Greg called Katie's house at about 4 p.m. to ask her about rumors she had been spreading about him. So petty bullshit, right? Yep. Katie was able to calm him down, and Belinda spoke with him, too. She checked that Jaden had enough clothing for the cold, and Greg told her that he was fine. He said he was going to finish working on the car, take a shower, and then bring Jaden back. I'm sorry, but these aren't things you do with a kid. You don't take him to work on your car, and you're taking a shower means you're not spending time with him. So, what the actual fuck with all this? I don't get it. There's not much I get about this. No. Well, then he added that Jaden had fallen out back with the dogs, but he would clean him up before he brought him back. And you think that would set off alarms, but it didn't. Nope. Now, later that afternoon, a neighbor heard Greg scream. He was seen outside hosing down the driveway. The neighbor said he couldn't figure out who Greg was screaming at. Now, no one heard from Greg until later that evening when he called Julie the babysitter and asked where Belinda was. She told him that Belinda, Katie, and Katie's boyfriend had left for the party. But then Belinda and Katie had had a fight, and Belinda had returned home with her daughter. Between 5.30 p.m. and 7.45 p.m., Belinda called Greg's house at least 20 times to tell him not to drop Jaden off at Katie's house as originally planned, but to bring him home. But there was no answer, and she said at this point she did begin to worry. Well, so not, a, for not her. enough to do anything about no, it. No, no, of course not. I mean, we're not sympathetic to this girl. Some things I've read on the case have been much kinder to her. Good. So Katie and her boyfriend showed up at Belinda's, and the sisters made up from that fight. They put on their makeup together, and Katie rushed Belinda out of the house. Belinda would say that she felt uneasy about Jaden, but decided to forget about it and have a good time. Well, you've got to set priorities here, right? <laughs> yeah. So she left her daughter at Katie's house with Julie, the babysitter, and went ahead to the party. Yeah, so Belinda wanted to stop at Greg's house to borrow his camera so we could take pictures at the party. But Katie's boyfriend's car wasn't registered, so Katie didn't want to get on a main road driving in an unregistered vehicle. And Belinda went along with this because she was just so stoked about the party. And once at the party, Belinda did call Greg again and got no answer. She expected him to drop Jaden with Julie, but she didn't call Julie at that point to see if Jaden had arrived. At a little after 8 p.m., a neighbor called Greg and asked if he wanted to smoke a bong with her and her husband, and he declined, saying he was babysitting. At 10 p.m., Greg called his next-door neighbor, Marianne McKinnon, 
and asked if she had any diapers because he was running out. This is a little strange because Belinda had sent Jaden with four diapers, and Greg didn't really like to change diapers. So, it's a little odd. Greg was known to avoid changing diapers and returning him to Belinda with a dirty diaper. Now, he would say that he changed Jaden's diaper twice that evening, so he should have still had two in Jaden's bag. I mean, that's if Belinda was correct about what she had packed. But Mary Ann, the neighbor, had no diapers and told Greg that the Mini Mart down the street would have some. Mary Ann would later say that she thought she heard a child and a dog playing in the background when she was on the phone with Greg, and she did believe it was Jaden she had heard. And now Belinda really enjoyed the party. (laughs) She drank heavily, which was her norm. After the party thinned out, a group decided to go to a nightclub, and this was around 10.30. Belinda and a few others, including Katie, arrived at the club before 11. At about 11.10, Belinda decided to call Greg to check on Jaden, and he answered this time. Shit's happened, Greg told her. Jaden had fallen against the heater, and he had taken him to the ER. They had put some cream on Jaden's bottom, but Greg didn't think they had done a good job, so he said he had taken the child to another hospital called Maryville. Belinda said, I'm going to come right home, but Greg convinced her to stay at the club. He said Jaden was fine. There was nothing she needed to do. He told her to call back later and he would pick her up. So at this point, Belinda said that she was very stressed and she told a couple of people at the club what Greg had told her. Her sister Katie decided that she would call Greg and find out what was really going on because he was this weird prankster. So Katie called Greg back. Greg told Katie they had been to the hospital because Jaden had fallen against the radiator and burnt his bottom, and the hospital had put cream on it. He's fine now, though, Greg said. Don't worry about it. Katie did ask how bad the burn was, and Greg said it wasn't bad. There were no blisters. Katie asked if they should come home, and he told her no. They should just enjoy the party. So Katie went back to Belinda, and told her that the burn story was just one of Greg's jokes, and this is according to Belinda. Greg had said that Jaden was fine and there was nothing to worry about. Katie would say that she actually told her sister that Jaden had been burnt, but that he had been treated. Greg had said there was no need to rush home. So a bit of a discrepancy there. Katie said later that she never would have believed that the burn story was a joke. Although Belinda and others often played practical jokes on Greg, and he played them on them. But they never played sick jokes on each other, Katie said. Although we don't really find that to be true, I would think changing the children's beds is a sick joke. There's there's some sick jokes going on. Absolutely. But either way, Belinda felt reassured when her sister spoke to her that Jaden was okay and she was happy to continue partying. The sisters continued to drink for several more hours. Belinda lost count of how many drinks she'd had that night, but she had spent $60 on herself. Sometime before 1 a.m., Mary Ann McKinnon was on her computer when she heard Greg's car start in the driveway. Mary Ann knew cars well, and she knew the sound of Greg's car. She heard it start, reverse, and drive away. Belinda's neighbor, Kim Wilson, was up to use her bathroom at around 12.30 a.m., and she heard Greg's car in the street. She even looked out her window and saw his green XC Falcon pull up outside of Belinda's house, so she felt sure it was his car. A guy named Brett McGrath was flirting with Belinda at the club that night. He asked her to sleep with him in his van, But by the end of the night, she was so drunk and so loud that everyone decided she should go home. The club had stopped serving Belinda, and then they stopped serving Katie because Katie was buying drinks for Belinda. So at about 1.30 a.m., Katie told Belinda she needed to call Greg to pick her up and take her home. So Belinda called Greg at 2 a.m. He agreed to pick her up and left his house at 2.15 and the club was about 25 minutes away. Katie and her boyfriend were with Belinda, who was really out of control and just yelling at anyone who walked by. When Greg pulled up at the club, Katie put her head into the car and told him to take Belinda home. She did notice that Jaden wasn't in the car, but it didn't really surprise her. Belinda had told her that a friend named Jackie had been at Greg's house earlier, so Katie thought Jackie was probably watching Jaden. 
Belinda got into the car with Greg, and she asked him right away where Jaden was. And he said, I told you, he's in the hospital. Yeah, he told Belinda that Jaden was in the new Marysville hospital. Now, the hospital wasn't even built yet, but Belinda didn't know that. So she demanded that he take her there to see her son. Greg discouraged that, though. He told her that she was drunk, and the hospital staff would think badly of her if she showed up to see her son in that condition. He was adamant that he wouldn't take her there while she was drunk. He told her she needed to sleep, and he would take her to see Jaden in the ne- in the morning. Yeah, Melinda argued, but she finally agreed to go home and sleep off the alcohol. So Greg first drove to his house, and when he pulled into the driveway, he saw that his front windows were broken. There were holes in the windows and jagged pieces of glass in the yard. Greg and Belinda went inside, and Greg ran through the house looking in all the rooms and in the cabinets. He told Belinda that he knew his ex-girlfriend Yvonne was responsible. Greg and Yvonne had had a very volatile relationship with violence, repeated breakups, and even restraining orders. Recently, Yvonne and Belinda had been feuding as well. They had done pranks on one another, made abusive phone calls, and even vandalized one another's property. When they saw each other, it really wasn't uncommon for one of them to call out slut or whore at the other one. So Belinda believed that Yvonne was the one who had swapped her children into each other's beds as a sick joke, and Belinda had followed up by spray-painting profanity on the front window of the store where Yvonne worked. But really at the heart of the feud was Belinda's relationship with Greg, of course. So it made sense that Greg thought Yvonne was responsible, or at least tried to put it off on her. And so Greg was looking for something in the house. Belinda didn't know what he was looking for. So she lay down on the living room floor near the heater, and she was playing Greg's Nintendo game. And according to the video game display, it was 3.04 in the morning. Greg said nothing about Jaden's burns, and he didn't say that Jaden was missing either. He called Yvonne at 3.09 in the morning and screamed at her before hanging up angrily. Then after about ten more minutes, he decided to take Belinda home. He began rushing out the door, and she complained that she was tired and she wanted to stay. She was under the impression that Jaden was in the hospital. It didn't occur to her that the broken windows could be related to her or her son. As they left the house, they saw a severed pig's head on the gravel in Greg's front yard. (laughs) It was shocking, I guess, but they kept on going to Belinda's house. They got to her house at about 3.20 in the morning. Once inside, Belinda lay down on the floor in her living room. And Brett said he was going to leave because he wanted to find out who had vandalized his house. Yeah, Belinda was still drunk, but she'd gotten her second wind. So she called Brett McGrath's house, the guy she'd been flirting with, to see if he got home okay, but he wasn't home. So then she called Julie the babysitter to check on her daughter Brianna and to check if maybe Jaden was with her and not in the hospital after all. So can you explain that to me? No. (laughs) Okay. I, I don't have an explanation. Okay, because if she really believed he was in the hospital, why is she calling the babysitter and asking her that? I don't know. I guess the only thing is she's heavily intoxicated, and she's just not thinking clearly. Well, Julie answered the phone and told Belinda that Jaden was with Greg, so this did set off some alarms in Belinda's mind. So Belinda called Greg's house from her house, and he did answer, and he told her he was trying to figure out who had vandalized his house. Belinda asked him to come back to her house, not asking about Jaden at all, and as she waited for Greg to come back, she fell asleep on her floor again. It was an hour and a half later when Greg woke her, and he was in an apparent panic. They had to go to the police, he said, because Jaden was missing. Belinda had pretty much passed out from her excessive alcohol consumption, and she woke up to Greg slapping her face and yelling at her to wake up. He was crying and yelling, I've lied to you, I've lied to you. Jaden's not in the hospital, he's missing. So Belinda was disoriented, but she got off the floor and got into Greg's car with him. And he drove them to the police station. By now it's close to 5 a.m. Greg went to the counter and frantically told the constable there that a 14-month-old boy had been abducted. And then he told him about the broken windows and the pig's head. Belinda was still drunk and she was confused. She said that Greg was wrong, that Jaden was actually in the hospital. But Greg was crying, and he insisted that Jaden had disappeared. 
two officers were sent to Greg's house, while Greg and Belinda were separated for interviews. And in her interview, Belinda was very confused. The detective told her that her boyfriend had killed her son, and she wasn't sure what to believe. So she was interviewed all that day and didn't return home until about 10 p.m. Sunday night. Now, Yvonne and Greg had broken up just a couple of weeks before Jaden disappeared. And even though Greg was in a relationship with Belinda, he certainly wasn't over Yvonne. Yvonne's brother, Kenny, absolutely hated Greg. And when Greg was continuing to call her, Kenny threatened him. He told Greg, leave Yvonne alone. I'm going to beat the shit out of you. So Kenny was brooding over how Greg was continuing to harass his sister. He had talked to another boyfriend of Yvonne's about it, named Darren. So Darren heard that Greg was still calling Yvonne. He and Kenny were very angry, and they started thinking of ways to get back at Greg. So this is when they decided that breaking the windows in his house and leaving a severed pig's head in his yard was a great idea. Yeah, I don't know how you get to that point where you think that's a good idea. It seems like a bit of a leap. It's a big leap, isn't it? I mean, these two guys sound like the rest of the crew, so I would think they'd just go over and beat the crap out of them or something like that. But no, they're much more inventive. Well, I guess Greg had kind of a history where he'd had a pet pig, and when the pig had been slaughtered, he kept parts of the pig in his freezer to remember him by or something. So there's a bunch of weirdness here. I guess. Yeah. But I guess that they thought throwing a pig's head through Greg's window would be kind of like something you see in the Mafia movies. Kenny had two pigs at his home that he had been raising for food, and he'd killed one of them a few days earlier. And then on the day before Jaden went missing, he decided to kill the other one. So after killing the pig in his yard, he actually hung the pig's body in his shower to drain the blood and kept the pig's head. So slaughtering animals in their yards was something they did, and this is not a farm. No. No. So the plan was that Yvonne would drop off Kenny and Darren at Greg's house, where they would throw the head through a front window. After being dropped off, Kenny and Darren watched Greg's house for several minutes. Greg's car was in his driveway, pointed towards the yard, with his trunk open. They saw Greg come out of the house. He walked to a large garbage bin and dropped a white plastic bag inside. A few minutes later, Greg got into his car and drove away. So Kenny went and threw the pig's head at the window. But it just bounced off. It didn't break through the glass. So he did it again until it, he thought it went through the window, but it didn't. It was lying on the ground. So I'm going to take a wild guess and think that these guys were probably a little bit drunk, too. Well, they were probably under the influence of something. Yeah. But then Kenny and Darren threw rocks at the house, and they did break several windows. They heard dogs barking like crazy, but they said they never heard a child cry. Kenny said he hid beneath a window for several minutes, so if there had been a baby inside, he would have heard the baby crying. Yvonne went back and picked them up a couple of blocks away, and then they stopped at the mini-mart for cigarettes and soda before they returned to Yvonne's house. Then it was 3.09 when Greg called Yvonne's house. And he didn't mention that Jaden was missing or that a child had been in the house. Like if he'd thought that they took the child, you think he would have said something. Right. So it so happens that Greg had been pulled over that night by the police. Yeah, kind of the early morning after most of this shit had happened. He was given a breathalyzer, which was negative. Now, the policeman was very familiar with Greg. He knew Greg was a cocky guy who always talked back to the police. But that night, Greg was pretty subdued. The officer looked in the car's back seat, but didn't open the trunk. The significant thing, though, is that Greg didn't mention Jaden at all, nor did he mention the pig's head or the broken windows. And this was after Greg had taken Belinda to her house when he found his home had been vandalized. So you would think this would be something you'd mention to the police, right? Sure, of course he would. Now that Sunday, homicide detectives were called in for the apparent abduction of a child. Although Greg claimed Jaden was missing, police believed that there was probably a homicide involved. Greg had told detectives early that morning that he had left Jaden alone at his house when he left to go pick up Belinda at the club. Yeah, but I mean, at this point, police aren't able to confirm if Jaden was dead or alive. He may have been taken by a family member, you know, be his natural father, maybe. 
or a stranger. The pig's head incident could have been completely unrelated. The police were well aware of the volatile relationship between Yvonne and Greg. I mean, let's be honest, the police were familiar with this group of people. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> these guys spent their whole lives getting into trouble of some sort. Yeah. So. And there have been numerous incidents of breaking restraining orders and these complaints of vandalism. It's really nothing new to police, except now poor Jaden is involved. So when he talked to the police, Greg had told them he believed Yvonne was responsible for the windows and for the pig's head. But they didn't believe that Yvonne had anything to do with Jaden's disappearance, and of course Jaden's whereabouts are the priority, not the vandalized house. And significantly, Greg's windows only had small holes in them from the rocks that were thrown, and no one had knocked out the jagged edges to get access to climb into the house. There was also no dirt or blood inside the house. Also, the blinds and the curtains and the furniture were totally undisturbed. So if anyone had entered the house while Greg was away, they would have had to have had a key because he swore that he locked the doors. Yeah, now Yvonne was brought into the station and she folded pretty quickly, talked about her part in the vandalism. She told them that she had driven the car and she identified Kenny and Darren as being involved. And these guys were also interviewed and they all, three of them, ended up giving the same story. But on the other hand... Greg's story just wasn't believable. So police were thinking that the vandalism had been a coincidence. The actions of Yvonne, Darren, and Kenny had nothing to do with a child abduction. And the investigation was about whether it was Greg, Greg and Belinda, or an unknown person who was responsible for Jaden's disappearance. Yeah, now the local hospitals that were open were called and there was no record of Jaden being there. And Greg admitted he had made the story up completely to Belinda on the phone. But he never gave an explanation of why he did that. He just kind of talked in circles. I mean, he wasn't mentally well. And he was very manipulative as well. And Belinda was acting both as a grieving mother and as a suspect. She had mood swings from being distraught to just wanting to go home and sleep. She said that she wanted to sleep and wake up and find that the disappearance was just a bad dream. So to me, that shows that she kind of wants to do a purposeful denial, which is kind of what she'd been doing all along with Greg watching Jaden and the things that were happening. Right. It's just easier to choose not to know about things. And I believe that's where she was coming from. You know, Greg wasn't being held by the police. They had decided to follow him and follow his movements to see if he would return to where he had hidden Jaden's body, if, in fact, Jaden was dead. So they also made a decision not to impound his car. They wanted to examine it, but they wanted more to let Greg remain mobile in case he could lead them to Jaden. If they did know that Jaden was dead, they would have done immediate forensic testing on his vehicle. Right, but if Jaden was alive and he was just somewhere, maybe injured or badly hurt, the only way for the police to have any chance at saving him is to let Greg go off and maybe follow him somewhere. You know, on the very slim chance that they might find the child and he might be okay. Right. So Greg left the police station at 2 a.m. on Monday morning, and he drove straight to Belinda's house. Belinda was home, and she noticed for the first time that Jaden's room was messed up. When she got home drunk the night before, she hadn't bothered to check Jaden's room, but she remembered she had left the room neat with his bed made. And now the bedding was all messed up. The mattress was on the floor, and the curtains were knocked, falling off of a rod. So someone had been in that room. So it would seem. When Belinda first left the police station, she felt sure that Greg had killed her son. The police had convinced her and she told her mother that she wanted to torture Greg to get the truth out of him. But then, when Greg showed up at her house, Belinda seemed to change her mind completely. He apologized, and she believed he was innocent, at least for a while. But, you know, Belinda was clearly feeling some guilt, and I'd have to say rightly so. She'd given her son to a man who had abused him before, and she knew it. Then, she'd continued partying after she was told that Jaden had been injured. I mean, no decent mother would do that. So maybe it was just easier for her to believe Greg 
than to accept that she had turned her son over to his killer so she could go out drinking. So that's maybe why she wanted to accept his apology. It's the only way I can put it together. Yeah, I think so. Belinda did become Greg's biggest defender. Greg was upset, and he cried more than Belinda did. Belinda didn't believe that Jaden was dead. She continued to be hopeful that Yvonne was hiding Jaden, all as part of some elaborate prank. Between bouts of crying, Greg would make jokes and act as if nothing had happened. The search for Jaden Lesky involved over 30 police officers and 20 volunteers. Forensics processed Greg's house. In the garbage bin outside, they found a plastic bag that had five bloody tissues inside of it. Some of the tissues were twisted up, like you would if you were putting them up a nose to stop a bloody nose or maybe even a bleeding ear. They also found $600 in cash under Greg's mattress, and the cash was wet. The bills were laid out flat as if to dry them, and the wet money really provided a connection with Greg's wallet, which police had found soaking wet in his car. It really didn't look like it had been dropped into a puddle or splashed. It appeared that it had been immersed in water. Also, police had found Greg's jacket was wet and lying in the back seat of his car. There had been some rain on Saturday, but not enough to soak the jacket or wallet like they were. Belinda told investigators she was too distraught to speak to the media, even though the police had called her and they wanted her to make a plea for Jaden's return. But she said, no, no, I'm too upset, I can't. Okay, but then they found out that Belinda had given an interview to a TV show called Today Tonight, and she had been paid for this interview. So that just makes her look horrible. Belinda was talked to by homicide detectives then, and she finally agreed to speak to the media and ask for Jaden to be returned unharmed. But judgment of Belinda by the public became very harsh. I mean, she looked sympathetic, but the facts of the case really looked bad once you learned anything about it. Yeah, officials and volunteers were searching Lake Narakan and Mundara Dam that Tuesday. The lake was about eight kilometers from Greg's house, and the dam was uh, 20-some kilometers from town. Brett Lesky was out of town working, but he returned after being notified of his son's disappearance. It took him some time to get the money to fly home. Local business owners donated money to help him. Yeah, but then Greg and Belinda left town on Wednesday, June 18th. Now, of course, they were under constant surveillance, but it was just a stupid thing to do. And why would you leave town if your child's missing? Public sympathy for Belinda was fading away because she was spending a lot of time with Jaden's suspected killer. The couple returned to the police station and they did give blood samples, but then they were both eager to leave the area to escape the media chaos and the public judgment. But finally, friends convinced them that if they kept leaving, they were just going to look more guilty. They needed to stay put. Now, once he was back in town, Brett Lesky was interviewed by the police. Now, once he knew the details, he just got more and more angry. And he ended up speaking to anyone who asked him for an interview. He wanted his son back, and he just couldn't believe how anyone would have left a one-year-old child home alone. Yeah, so Greg finally gave a video-recorded interview with the police on Thursday, June 19th. He explained that he had met Brett in school, and they had worked together on cars, and then he had met Belinda through Brett, and he had been regularly babysitting Jaden for months. When asked about his time with Jaden on the previous Saturday, Greg said they had spent the day working on a car, playing with the dogs, and playing Nintendo. These are three things that a one-year-old doesn't do. Well, I think it'd be tough playing Nintendo as a one-year-old. Maybe the dogs... Yeah, but this wasn't safe, and this was all stuff he wanted to do. It wasn't anything for Jaden's sake. And a really weird thing is he said they didn't eat all day. Greg hadn't eaten breakfast, and he wasn't hungry for lunch either, and he said that Jaden wasn't hungry either. He said he assumed that Belinda had fed Jaden before he picked him up, and he explained that he had once tried to feed Jaden cereal, but Jaden had refused to eat it, so this time he just didn't bother. Yeah, well, you know... This is the guy who force-fed the kid peanut butter sandwiches till he vomited. So maybe Jaden just said, I'm not going to eat anything that this guy's given me. 
Yeah, he might think that way, sure. So after he worked on his card, Greg said he took Jaden inside the house and put him in front of the heater to warm up. The Great Escape was on TV, and Greg watched it with Jaden because he wanted Jaden to learn man things. Yeah, Greg said Jaden had stood in front of the heater for too long and had burnt his bottom. He said he seemed okay, though, and he wasn't crying. So Greg said he normally would not have left Jaden alone, but it was different on Saturday night because Jaden was sound asleep. He said he left the house locked, picked up Belinda, and drove her home. But Greg couldn't explain why he didn't tell Belinda that Jaden was at his house then, but told her that he was in the hospital. Yeah, an important detail, huh? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't make sense. He said he got to his house and saw that it had been vandalized. The door was still locked, he said, but when he went inside, Jaden was missing. He said he searched the cupboards, thinking that maybe Jaden had woken up and he was afraid, and he'd crawled into a cabinet to hide. You know, going over Greg's movements that night, there was some time that was unaccounted for. Remember, Belinda had called him about 20 times between 4.45 and 8.30 in the morning, but he didn't answer the phone. Greg insisted he had not left the house at all except to pick up Belinda. He said that his neighbor and Belinda's neighbor must have been confused and mistaken, but he had no answer about why he had not mentioned that Jaden was missing when police pulled him over. That's a huge hole in his story. Well, there are a lot of holes, right? Well, that's a pretty big one. But that's a big one. Now, and he explained the bloody tissues in the garbage bin by saying that Jaden had fallen over and hurt his nose. Or lip, he couldn't remember which. Then he said that Jaden had a scab on his nose, which one of the dogs had licked off, causing him to bleed. And so this interview is just going on in circles. He remembered cutting himself on Saturday and said some of the blood on the tissues may have been his. Yeah, so after Greg left that night, detectives brought Belinda back in for another interview. At this point, Belinda was completely on Greg's side. She had spent the night with him, and she was defending him. She was told that if she insisted on collaborating with the prime suspect, then she was going to be treated like a suspect as well. So Belinda really couldn't have looked much worse to the public at this point. And the police told her, you know, lady, you've forsaken your son, and you're on the side of the suspected killer. That does not look good, so you're a suspect too. But surprisingly, Greg had quite a few supporters. But they didn't know how inconsistent his story was, because he's telling different people different things. He told one person that his wallet got wet from falling into a puddle, and he told another person that it got wet when he left it in the trunk of his car. And I guess Belinda was just continuing to be confused. When the police told her Jaden had probably been killed by Greg, then she started believing them again. But then she went and spent more time with Greg, and she was again convinced of his innocence. So she's just really, I hate to say stupid, but what's wrong with her? Stupidity. Okay. Is that your medical diagnosis? (laughs) <laughs> no. <laughs> so on Monday, June 23rd, Lake Narakan was drained, as well as nearby swamps and marshes. Greg told his friends that they wouldn't find anything there. He said the police were just wasting their time. Since much of the evidence pointed to water, the police believed that Jaden had been hidden in or near water. So as the search went on, Belinda lost custody of her daughter Brianna to Brett Lesky. Then on July 1st, the homicide unit announced that the investigation was now a murder investigation. They didn't believe there was any chance that Jaden was still alive. There was a mine shaft that became the target of the search. Greg had fished in the area, and he knew the dam nearby very well. All the searches were dead ends. So a decision was made to charge Greg with murder without a body. Yes, so Greg was arrested and he was held in jail pending his trial. Once he was locked up, Belinda became convinced of his guilt again. She started to think more about Greg's behavior with Jaden, and she wrote an accusing letter to Greg. In the letter, she said that she knew he was guilty. She wanted to visit him in jail and kill him. But then, in early August, Belinda changed her mind again and said she believed Greg was innocent. She'd gone to visit him in jail, and now she was blaming the police for framing Greg. 
but she would change her mind again by October, blaming Greg again. There were reports that autumn that Belinda and Greg were engaged. Now Belinda would deny this. The story was that she had visited him in jail, and he had given her a ring that his mother had smuggled into the jail and proposed to her. And a lot of people think that really did happen. Well, it wouldn't be a surprise. No, really, not much would surprise me about this. No. New Year's Day, 1998. There is a family picnicking at Blue Rock Dam when the, the son of the family found Jaden's body floating. body was decomposed, but had been preserved enough by the cold water that he could be recognized. When Belinda heard that the body of a child had been found, she went out to the dam. She cried and wanted to give her son a final hug, but she was kept away. So other things were found with Jaden. There was a plastic bag with a baby bottle in it. There was also some blue rope. There was something that looked like an industrial bag, too, that was weighed down with some kind of a steel bar. And the industrial bag turned out to be a sleeping bag tied to a crowbar. The sleeping bag had burst open so that the zipper was closed, but the stitching was torn. The plastic bag had been stuffed into the sleeping bag, and the sleeping bag had been tied to the crowbar and dropped into the water. Some items taken out of the sleeping bag in the water were laid out on a white piece of canvas, and there were items found that Belinda had packed for Jaden that Saturday when he was with Greg. So these items included the baby bottle, an apple, a bib, and his clothing. In prison, Greg collapsed when he heard that Jaden's body had been found. In the newspaper, a friend of Greg's recognized the crowbar he had loaned to Greg. He said that he had asked Greg about getting some tools back from him prior to his arrest, but Greg had said he didn't know where the crowbar was. Now, all crowbars pretty much look alike but it is kind of a coincidence that the crowbar was the missing tool and Jaden was found tied to a crowbar. Indeed. We're going to talk a little bit about his injuries. So Jaden had a fractured skull. He also had two fractures of his arm, which had been bandaged. Jaden was found in some of the clothing his mom Belinda had sent with him when he was with Greg, and his body had been weighed down in the water with the crowbar. The bandage was an elastic type of bandage on his left arm, and it covered his skin from elbow to wrist. The autopsy would show that his arm had been broken no more than two days before the death, due to there being no signs of healing. But this fracture would have caused so much pain that probably his arm had been broken near the time of his death. It's not like he would go around for days with this break and be okay. So this broken arm brought up many questions in the trial, an orthopedic surgeon testified that the type of fracture Jaden had wasn't consistent with a fall or a blow, such as would have happened if the car had fallen on his arm. It looked like someone had grabbed Jaden and snapped his arm between his two hands. So the cause of Jaden's death was determined to have come from a skull fracture. But I'm going to have you tell us just a little bit about broken arms and child abuse. Or broken bones in child abuse? Broken bones? Well, I think the, the biggest thing we're taught is that if there's unexplained breaking of bones or, or bones that normally wouldn't be broken, you should suspect abuse. So in kids, fractured ribs are a huge indicator of abuse. Little kids. And the type of fracture. I mean, kids' bones are soft, I guess you could put it. And when they break... They tend to crack. It's called green stick fractures. So say someone had put some twisting force on an arm or a leg, you could get a fracture. That's not the typical through and through fracture. Or in this case where they suspect that someone had grabbed him and snapped his arm between two hands, yeah, that could look a different way from if a heavy weight had fallen on it. So I'd be suspicious with the type of fracture that it was inflicted and not, not accidental. So if you have a green stick fracture of the two lower arm bones and parents show up at the ER with a one-year-old, what happens? Child Protective Services gets called, okay. among other things. I mean, the first thing, if I'm looking at a kid that has an unexplained fracture, 
I'm going to kind of scan his whole body and see if there's older fractures or older healing fractures, because very often there are. Right. Okay. There was also a drug. Benzhexyl, yeah. Benzhexyl was found in Jaden's blood. So this is a medication that used to be prescribed to treat Parkinson's disease, but Jaden had been drugged with this within hours of his death. So I looked it up. Some of the side effects include dizziness, sedation, and even hallucinations. It's been used as a recreational drug as well, which might explain why it would be in Greg's house. So it's likely that this medication would have been given to Jaden to put him to sleep. The prosecution believed that Greg had abused Jaden and broken his arm. Then Greg didn't take Jaden to the hospital because he didn't want to get into trouble. So instead, he gave him this drug to stop him from screaming and crying. And the onset of action of the drug is usually one to two hours when taken orally. Now, I would imagine that's with adults and things are different with children. Well, yeah, I mean, I suppose you could think that the Benzhexol would be some kind of pain reliever. But it really doesn't offer pain relief. It just kind of sedates them. It does that, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I can see the, the scenario, though. If he broke the little kid's arm in whatever, a fit of rage, and the kid wouldn't stop crying, he gives him the drug, he still won't stop crying because it hurts like hell, and he bashes him in the head. Right. And he dies. <sighs> Well, that's why I wonder about the room being messed up. If maybe he tried to put Jaden in his bed there to try and cover the whole thing up, but that didn't work out. No, and, and remember that Belinda's neighbor was pretty sure she had seen his car. Yes, yep. Even though he says, no, nah, it wasn't me. Well, Belinda and Katie, after looking at photos of Jaden's body, both said that his hair looked longer than it had been when they last saw him. So they suggested that maybe someone had abducted Jaden and kept him alive for some time. But the skin around hair and fingernails actually recedes after death. So this wasn't considered to be a significant thing. Now, Greg had been in jail for 14 months before his trial began. That's how old Jaden was. One month for each month of life. The trial began in October of 1998. In the trial, it was revealed that some blood found on Jaden's bib and pants matched that of an unknown woman. This did not match any of the women involved in the case or in Jaden's life in any way. But a coroner's inquest would eventually discover that this blood evidence had been contaminated by evidence from an unrelated rape case that was handled by the same lab. So that hurts the case, of course. Yeah. The prosecution focused on Greg's history of abusive behavior, also his conflicting stories about what happened on the night that Jaden disappeared. They brought up how on several occasions, Greg was seen by friends locking Jaden outside with the dogs and ignoring him when he cried. Also, Jaden had been returned from Greg's house with abrasions and bruises. Belinda had overlooked these incidents at the time, but there was also some indication that Belinda herself had abused Jaden. An examination of x-rays taken of Jaden showed a possible rib fracture that had significantly healed, meaning it was probably incurred, what, months before we he died? At least weeks, yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the ones you mentioned that's a strange injury for a child that age. Would it be is. suspicious. Well, you, again, you're very often going to find old rib fractures on kids, infants that are abused. Right, because usually by the time they get any help, they've been abused for a while. Yes. Yeah, unfortunately. But Belinda had admitted to kicking Jaden to several people. So people were aware of that. But of course, no one had done anything then either to protect Jaden. So despite circumstantial evidence that Greg had killed Jaden, along with the fact that Jaden was in his care and Greg was the last person to be with Jaden, Greg was acquitted. He wasn't even convicted of child abuse or neglect. And Belinda wasn't charged at all. So the entire story is one of a failure to protect or get justice for Jaden, this one-year-old baby who was completely dependent on the adults in his life, who didn't take care of him and didn't keep him safe. You know, due to double jeopardy laws, 
Greg's not going to be retried for the same crime. Despite the evidence pointing towards him having played a part in Jaden's disappearance and or death, he was found to be not guilty. It was later determined that Greg had allegedly confessed to a fellow inmate while he was in custody. And in this confession, Greg allegedly told the inmate that Jaden's death had been an accident. Greg had said that while he was out working in his car, something had happened that caused the jacked vehicle to fall on Jaden. This would have explained Jaden's broken arm, as well as the painkillers that were later found in his blood. Well, no, it doesn't, because the fracture of his arm wasn't consistent with a heavy object falling on it. Right, but in Greg's mind, it was an explanation right, of why his arm was broken and why he had given him the drugs. But yeah, it's not a valid explanation. No. However, the testimony of the inmate was found to be inadmissible, and it wasn't allowed in the trial. Well, yeah, because the inmate was known as a liar, so he wasn't going to be credible. So there were new inquests in 2004 and 2006, very critical of both Greg and the Victorian Police's Forensic Science Unit, whose mishandling of evidence made it really difficult to re-examine or use years later. No one other than Greg has been charged with or suspected in Jaden's murder. There does remain a small possibility that Greg could be retried because Australia has made some exceptions to their double jeopardy laws. In some rare cases where suspects have been acquitted, they have been retried years later if new evidence is found. I think that's the key thing, right? New evidence. And it has to be significant. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Okay. So according to a 2018 article in the Sydney Morning Herald, most states and territories in Australia have had changes in the laws to allow someone to be tried twice for an offense, but only in exceptional circumstances. Most states require that for someone to be charged again for an offense that they have previously been acquitted of, there must be new slash fresh evidence, compelling evidence, and it must be a serious offense such as murder or rape. Also, in all the circumstances, it's in the interests of justice for the order to be made. So it has to be, you know, we're going to get justice for this if we are able to do this, which I would think would be in most cases, right? Right. In New South Wales, the offense must be a life sentence offense to be tried again meaning the maximum term of imprisonment must be life before a person can be charged a second time. In Queensland, the serious offense must be either murder or have a possible imprisonment of 25 years or longer. And in South Australia, it must be a Category A offense. So in order for the evidence to be fresh and compelling, it must not have been presented in the previous proceeding and not been available then either. It also must be very reliable, and it must be substantial, of course. The exception can't be used where a person was acquitted of a more serious offense, but convicted of a lesser offense. So if someone is convicted of manslaughter, but not of murder, you can't take them back and recharge them with murder. Back in 2000, Belinda became pregnant with another child, and she gave birth to a son, who she named Caleb Aiden Williams. She married the father of this baby, Jeremy Williams, in late 2001, and they wanted to honor Jaden by putting part of his name in their new son's name. So his middle name is Aiden, Jaden without the J. It's pretty certain that Belinda did not kill Jaden, but you know, she left him with a known abuser and went out to drink and party. Then, even after hearing stories of her son being injured and taken to the hospital, she continued to party. So her behavior is not murder, but she definitely showed poor judgment and she definitely neglected her son. But over the years, Belinda has shown regret for her mistakes as a mother. And she and Jeremy had a second son, too, who they named Corin. So I really don't know how to feel about that because I really don't think that she should have children. But then on the other hand, should we be able to forgive her? You didn't read her letter that she sent to Greg? To Greg. I did read it, yes. I just didn't I decided not to include it because yeah. it was lengthy. Well, if you read that letter, all you can think of, at least all I could think of was that this piece of shit 
thinks that she can apologize for how she treated her son and that everything's okay. Yeah. No, it's not. No, she should have been punished. I mean, really, she should have been tried for what? For abuse and neglect. Yeah. I mean, that's your baby. You're responsible to take care of that baby. Well, and they took her daughter out of her home. Yeah, right. So how was she able to remarry and have two kids? I mean, it reminds me of that sugar babe lady who had a whole bunch of kids taken away and then went and had another bunch of kids. Yep. I think once a kid is taken away, that's it. You don't get another chance. I I think you lose your permit for a parent. Yeah, being a parent is not a right. I mean, it's a privilege. So you shouldn't just be allowed to do that. Now, I really think from the letter, she did sound like she felt guilty and like she had probably grown some, and she was probably a more responsible mother with these other children. But at the same time, does that really matter? It doesn't make it right. Yeah, you could also read that letter as a self-serving, meaningless letter. It is a bit self-serving, I'll agree. I mean, she has a lot of guilt, and she's trying to make herself feel better. Okay, so the resources for this episode were a book called The Jaden Lesky Murder by Michael Gleason, and some articles from the Sydney Morning Herald, one about contamination in the Lesky case and one about explaining double jeopardy in Australia. Also, some articles from the Herald Sun, one of them about the Jaden Lesky murder trial and another about how his death will haunt everyone until a killer is convicted. Now, I don't see that a killer will ever be convicted, and there'll never be justice for this child. Well, they're not going to retry Greg, are they? I don't think so. I mean, unless something really significant was to come about. But now we're talking like 20 years it's been. Yeah. So it's just a totally sad case. What can we take away from this that would be positive? I'm thinking. Okay. I don't have any positives. Well, maybe we can learn a little bit from it? Sure. So thank you to Tristan for our theme music and a bit of housekeeping. We're going to be taking a week off again on January 7th, but other than that, we're going to have a new episode every Tuesday morning, plus we'll have our members-only episodes. If you haven't joined Team Tie Grabber, why the hell not? You know, it's fun, it's cheap, and all the kids are doing it. Don't you want to be one of the cool kids? But seriously, we're really working hard on commercial-free members-only episodes, which we put out at least once a month, And recent episodes include the murder of Adrian Reynolds, John List's family murders, A.B. Shermer, the wife-killing preacher, Christopher Porco, who axed his parents for their life insurance money. The list goes on and on of horrible people. Coming up, we're working on some research on Amber Hilberling, who allegedly pushed her husband from a window in their high-rise apartment. Also, we're looking at the murder of San Antonio mother of three, Susan McFarland. You can be a Tie Grabber member for as little as $4 a month. And when you join, you have your choice of a welcome to the brewery gift, which we'll send to you with a nice handwritten thank you note. Just go to TieGrabber.com, click on subscribe, and you'll learn more. Okay, Dick has some good feedback today. He's very excited about sharing. What have you got, Dick? I've got a voicemail and some emails. How about that? Sounds good. So the voicemail is from Marissa, and she has some beer recommendations for us. So I I knew you always wanted to have new recommendations. Well, usually for cases, but for beer, okay. Hey, Dick and Jill. This is Marissa from Illinois. I just wanted to call and say thank you for the great podcast. Um, I'm new to the podcast game. I recently started homebrewing and I was trying to find a good podcast about beer and I stumbled upon yours Um, and I love listening to you guys. So thank you so much um, for the great content. I do have some uh, beer recommendations for Dick. If you guys ever have a case in either Illinois or Wisconsin, um, I have two breweries for you. The first one is a Wisconsin brewery. It's called New Glarus and you can't really go wrong at all. I'm with any of their beer. They're just really good. I live pretty close to the border, and um, you know I've taken a few trips just to go get some of their beer. Uh, the other one is an Illinois company. It's called Revolution, and it's awesome. Uh, my boyfriend really likes Antihero, which is an IPA, and I'm a really big fan of their holiday ale. It's called Fistmas, F-I-S-T-M-A-S. Both are really, really good, delicious beers. 
So if you ever have a case um, out here, I hope you will consider trying them. But thank you so much for an awesome podcast. It's great listening. Thank you, Marissa. Yeah, those are two good breweries. And I was checking. I didn't think I'd had any beers from either one, and I haven't. Uh, so definitely, next Illinois case or Wisconsin case, we'll hook up with those breweries, one of the breweries, and uh, drink a good beer from them. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Now we got some emails. This is for you, Jill. This is from a lady named Benita, which you might recognize. Right. So this was an email we got from Benita Alexander, and she was the fiancé of the doctor who made the um, faulty trachs that were killing people and also had a whole other family while he was engaged to her, Paolo Macchiarini. So Benita wrote, I stumbled across your podcast about the downfall of Paolo tonight as I was searching for something else. Generally, I don't torture myself by listening to people who offer their armchair analysis of my story and Paolo's outrageous lies, but I have to say you two impressed me. You've not only done your homework thoroughly, you raised all the questions that need to be asked. You also amused me. Jill's blunt, hilarious comments, such as uncommon fuckery, had me chuckling out loud. I appreciate Jill's gentle defense of me at moments when Dick was skeptically questioning why in the hell I didn't hear alarm bells screaming much sooner than I did. Love, unfortunately, can indeed make us very blind. Anyway, I thought you might find this article interesting if you haven't seen it already. And she sent us a link to an article. She wrote, It isn't really as dramatic as it sounds, as he won't actually have to serve any time behind bars. This is Italy, after all, where he is deeply connected, so it amounts to more of a stern warning or a probation, however you want to characterize it. It's another blemish on his once seemingly impeccable resume, but it still doesn't amount to much of a punishment for his medical and scientific crimes. I'll be tuning in again. Great show. So thank you, Benita. Thank you very much. Now, I know you clicked on the link and read the article, so what can you tell us about it? Well, as, as she said, it sounds worse than it actually was. The article is from Medscape, which is just a, a doctor type of thing where they publish different articles. And it's talked about him being sentenced to 16 months in prison for illegally performing a procedure, not, not his uh, faulty tracheas. But he did a procedure, and then he falsified the records or disposed of the records or something to escape detection. So it sounds like he's going to prison for 16 months. But as Miss Alexander stated, he didn't have to serve. He won't actually have to serve any jail time. Right. So, so. It's, it's just one more black mark against Dr. Macarini. Well, you know, in my opinion, once a doctor does something shady like that, that puts a person's life in danger or even kills someone, they shouldn't be a doctor anymore. I mean, well, if he were a U.S. doctor, he would have his license stripped. That's right. So the laws in Italy are different? That's what it is? Well, he's connected, as she said. Yeah. I just don't think that anyone should be able to operate on a person if they're not 100% trustworthy. We're talking about people's lives here. We are. The other interesting thing, I mean, we talked about how the Karolinska Institute kind of conveniently ignored the sirens that were going off about Dr. Macchiarini because they wanted the prestige associated with him. It was a fascinating story, so they, really. Just as, as Benita said, love is blind. I guess love in the case of the Karolinska Institute was equally blind. Yeah, because didn't she speak to some doctors who said that he was basically murdering people? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Horrific. Okay, so next we have a question about a case from Allison. Allison says, I'm a relatively new listener, but it only took me a couple of episodes to decide to join Team Tie Grabber. I've been listening in the car while doing housework and when I get into bed at night. Despite the sometimes grisly subject matter, I find your voices extremely relaxing. I came across a perplexing case with a bizarre medical twist that I thought would be interesting to dissect. Pun intended, probably. In Philadelphia in 1964, 33-year-old Calvin Jones was driving around with his girlfriend, 23-year-old Sarah Tolbert, when the two got into an argument and he proceeded to beat her with a rubber hose. He drove around for hours with her unconscious body until he realized that she had died, and then he went to a police station to turn himself in for murder. However, 
when the medical examiner performed the autopsy, he concluded that she would have died of a rare blood disease by the morning, regardless of the beating. She had sickle cell anemia, and the autopsy report attributed her death to natural causes. Ultimately, Jones was only charged with assault and battery and did plead guilty to those charges. I would love to hear Dick's medical opinion on this case. Is it possible for the MA to know for sure that Sarah Tolbert would have died in mere hours anyway? Are there medical advancements that would more accurately determine that today, over 50 years later? I love your podcast, and I'll definitely keep sending my money each month for the disturbing material, the clever married banter, and Dick's beer reviews. May the pores be with you. That's All a, right. Thanks, a, Allison. That's a groaner, Allison. I like that one. Yeah. So that is fascinating, though. Isn't it? What do you think? Well, you can't make that statement. I wouldn't think so either. That's what I thought. So that's, that's the short answer. Sickle cell anemia is a disorder where a single amino acid is switched in the chain for hemoglobin producing sickle cell disease, or if there's only one of them, sickle cell trait. And what that means is that under certain conditions, you can have uh, episodes of thrombosis or clotting in the blood vessel. So you can have these sickle cell crises that can lead to death, but not in that time period. Well, you can be hospitalized, and there are some things they can do to at least temporarily save you, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. So I don't see how he could say that. So... I mean, yes, you can find out or, or determine that she did have sickle cell anemia, but there's absolutely no way for him to say with any degree of certainty that she would have died within a short time from natural causes. Well, this might be a stupid question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. If the beating was making her have internal bleeding, could that put her into a sickle cell crisis? Well, there's lots of things that cause crisis, infection, stress, and so on. So, sure. Maybe the the trauma from the beating provoked a sickle cell crisis. That's what I'm thinking, yeah. But but even then, I mean, that's kind of cause and effect. Well, exactly. I mean, just because, I don't know. I'm trying to think of another example of such a thing where someone would be murdered and maybe they wouldn't have died if they didn't have a certain condition. It doesn't mean it's not murder. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. But I, I guess to answer Allison's question, though, no, there wasn't any way that he could give this diagnosis that, oh, she would have been dead very quickly. So let's research that then and see how he got away with that, because that's fascinating to me. We got away with it because the ME said... Well, how the ME got away with it, I mean. Why would an ME say that? And who would say okay and agree with that? Well, I suppose it was because maybe 60 years ago or whatever, 50-some years ago, there wasn't as much known about sickle cell disease. Well, yeah, that's and, something Allison herself did bring up. And you get an authority like this medical examiner who says, well, yeah, she she did have these injuries, but she would have died anyway with it because of her sickle cell disease. Right. And people will sign off on that. Well, and I guess part of that to me would also be the extent of the beating. Was it a beating that could have been deadly? So there's a lot I'd like to look into with that one. Yeah. That's a great one. Thanks, Allison. Interesting case. Okay, we have one more YouTube comment that you can read. This is from Ma'am229, and it's a YouTube comment from the episode called Four Little Witnesses, which involved the murder of Sheila Belish. Yeah, Sheila was a mother of, was it quadruplets? or Quadruplets. Okay, well, four, yeah, quadruplets, Right. right? And the little babies were with her when she was murdered. Right. And it was a murder carried out by someone her ex husband had hired. Right. All right. So Ma'am 29 wrote. So she says, I humbly disagree in this case. Using a belt is not abuse. The busybody neighbor did not do the right thing. The daughter was a spoiled brat who didn't like being told no. Okay. So if I remember correctly, this was a young teen or a tween daughter who was acting out. Sheila had remarried and she ran to her neighbor because her mom had hit her with a belt to discipline her. And the neighbor went ahead and called the father. So the father found out where they lived. The ex-husband, the murderer, she's the one that got them found out where they were. The neighbor did. 
So I don't think the neighbor should have done that. So I do think using a belt is abuse. And I do agree, though, that the neighbor did the wrong thing in telling the ex-husband, Alan Blackthorne, a true psychotic, where the family was living. I mean, she didn't know the situation. She didn't know who this guy was. But she did know that they were living in hiding away from him, and it was none of her business. So from what I remember of the case, Alan Blackthorne, the ex-husband, spoke to this neighbor and kind of charmed her. And she gave him information he shouldn't have had. And then Sheila ended up getting murdered. Not that long after. Right. So I think if the neighbor was really concerned about abuse, she should have simply called the police, spoken to the mother. But you don't just tell some man on the phone that you don't know anything about what's going on and where he can come get his daughter that he doesn't have custody of. That's my opinion. Yes. And I'll just go back to the the sentence. In this case, using a belt is not abuse. It most certainly is abuse. It is. And and if you come into my office and tell me that you had to punish your daughter by (laughs) whipping her with a belt, I'm calling Child Protective Services. So there's no place for corporal punishment of children, even if they're bratty 12-year-olds or whatever they are. I know. I mean, I almost sympathized with Sheila in this case, at least the way that the story was written out to me, is that the daughter was a hellion. But you're right. It doesn't justify using a belt. No way justifies that. No, you're right. So... We'll leave it at that. So we disagree about that, but thank you very much for your comment. So that's it for feedback. Now, if you have comments, suggestions, or questions, you can send us an email to truecrimebrewery at tigrebber.com, or even better, leave us a voicemail on our website, tigrebber.com, by clicking on the sidebar where it says send a voicemail. You click on that, and then there's a little microphone. You can just talk to your computer or your phone and leave us a little voicemail about a case you'd like us to look at, a comment on one of the cases we've covered, a question. A beer suggestion. A beer suggestion, anything like that. Yeah, we love voicemails. They've kind of slacked off lately, so let's pick it up, team. (laughs) Okay. Well, thanks to everyone for listening, and we'll see you next week at the quiet end. we still got some beer left. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.